Wow, way to put him on the spot. Can you hear me in the back, Josh? I see you up there. Okay, all right. Everybody knows Josh Boyer in the back? Yeah, yeah, okay. He just waved to the crowd. I'm Jeff Scheel, Chief Architect for Power Linux. How many people have heard of Power Systems? How many people have actually used Linux on a power system? Oh, my. You, you could, uh, uh, an old MacBook, Roddick says down front. <laughs> you know, that's, remind me to come back to that topic. The MacBook was actually a turning point. Um, I'm the crazy guy who's been around Power Linux since we started it. Now, I did submit one kernel patch, but I will never pretend to be a developer. So, I'm the guy in IBM who managed the first team that created the 64-bit kernel and the 64-bit libc that now is what we call Power Linux or Linux on Power. I'll use both of those interchangeably. Uh, and that meant we estab I helped establish the first relationship with Red Hat. That meant I was the guy to whom Josh always told me we needed to do more with Fedora. Yeah, Josh, we finally got the message. Thank you. <laughs> Which led to a great relationship with Phil, now Roddick, and others. Uh, and so I have to say thank you very much for inviting me out here to participate in this. My hope today is to give you a little bit of a sense of power systems and what we're doing with Linux, where we're headed. Yeah, yeah, I know this is supposed to be a technical presentation, so we'll stick to the technical things. Uh, I am an engineer at heart, so I do intermittently use slides that are from marketing. You would know I would never create something like this, first of all, too pretty. Um, unlike most engineering slides, there are too many words. Marketing slides tend to have fewer words. Uh, but the real reason we did Linux on power, and oftentimes the question I get is the very one that's on the title, why would anybody run Linux on power systems? This slide does a nice job of graphically showing that. If you take our heritage in the Unix market and our hardware and all the things we have accomplished with our proprietary Unix, that which must not be named in this room, sometimes referred to as a four-letter word these days, although it is only three. That heritage, you take the heritage that the hardware and what it can do and combine it with the innovation and the openness of where Linux is headed, it's a pretty good combination. And so that has been my motivating factor for the last 14 years, and that's where we begin. Honestly, when I tell customers, I said it's not really about the operating system. It's about your application, and it's about what the hardware platform can do for it. The idea is the operating system is there. It enables an environment for them, and then we get out of the way, and they really run their app on the hardware. So that's the answer, and most people think of power systems as being reliable, scalable, secure, pretty good performance. And the irony is most of those traits don't come from the operating system. They fundamentally come out of the hardware platform. So that's the first answer to why would anybody do it on power. The next thing we typically get into is, well, where does it run? Which power systems actually run Linux? Short answer, all of them. Which Linux? Well, your Linux. We talk about it as power Linux because, of course, there's your competitor, your friends. You've invited them here just like you invited me here. So, you know, we can use probably the SUSE word here and SLES. So, you know, we run both of those, but it's, it's, it's your Linux. I call it Power Linux because if every time I had to say SLES and RHEL, instead of saying Power Linux, it would be simple. But it's a very vast product line. On the left-hand side in the lower left, Typical one and two socket servers. This looks like what most people are buying today in the industry. And yet if you go to the top, I'll bet we could take advantage of the previous talk in RHEL 7, NUMA aware scheduling. 32 sockets up there. Large NUMA topology. I think there's three levels in that. I'd have to go check the details. One of the things about power systems is it has some of the flattest NUMA topology and I'll show you some of that coming up, where that comes from. Uh, and so 
really flat topology. Uh, the latencies between nodes as you scale out in the NUMA uh, world is, is pretty good as well. It's, it's, it's impressed some of the clients. As we scale up, you don't have the traditional problems that you have in an x86 system where you compromise your memory accesses by using up QPI, so I can prove I'm a technical guy. In the x86 architecture, power scales up without giving up that memory bandwidth. In fact, some of our mem best memory bandwidth is up at the top of our system. So where does it run? All of them. By the way, inside of IBM, we use Linux as the first operating system ever up on the system. Very funny story. I was down in South Africa a little over a year ago, and one of my colleagues from that operating system that shouldn't be named was bragging about how they had just brought it up on Power 8. He just accomplished that. Luckily, he was ahead of me, so I could come behind him, congratulate him on his accomplish accomplishment, and then point out that he'd had Linux up running on it three months before him. It was nice for them to finally catch up. So, so we use Linux on the top, and, and the reason that top system with 32 sockets at eight CPUs per socket, four hardware threads, as I'm going to show you, per core, gives you a total of a 1024 for those of you who are good at math, virtual CPUs into the operating system. That kind of scalability comes from work that we haven't done. It comes from work that's been done in the community. We've helped extend it, enable it, improve it. But that's the kind of work that allows me to bring Linux up first before the rest of my brethren back home. What Linux, Linux runs on it? Well, we're ready for RHEL 7. Huge work done in RHEL 7. We're part of the public beta. It's enabled for the Power 8 chip. I'm going to give you some more details about coming up later. We're excited about RHEL 7. RHEL 6, RHEL 5, as soon as the Red Hat team releases their product, power supported with it. I always have to remind people of that because we build it from the same source, compile it at the same levels, the packages are at the same levels. You know, this is all part of the commonality that is being driven in the enterprise. People tend to think of Linux as sometimes only an x86 environment. My job is to open their mind and say, hey, if you're running RHEL 6.3, it's still RHEL 6.3 when you get it to power. It's not anything different. Okay? We may do some things we think better, may perform better, give them different features, different platform environment around it, uh, but it's still RHEL 6.3. If I'm going to create my file systems, I'm going to send my volumes, if I'm going to use Apache, build a LAMP stack, all that stuff is common. And that's the benefit to the IT enterprise, and that's the benefit to our ISVs and our partners. It's about commonality. And finally, I mentioned Fedora. You mentioned R MacBooks. Josh remembers the history where uh, IBM kind of had some help from Apple with the MacBooks and the, the Power MacBooks. We weren't so interested in Fedora at that time. The MacBook world was really carrying Fedora. We got disinterested. The MacBook people walked away. The Apple people walked away. There was no ecosystem, and Fedora died for power. And Josh came back and said, we need to do this, we need to do this. Best decision we ever made. So in Fedora 16, we went back and we relaunched the power version of Fedora in such a way that we focus now on power systems. We left some of the legacy things behind, so the old world sort of had to die, wrap up, and we started forward on power servers. And now we've done some great work in Fedora 19, Fedora 20, LLVM, GNOME desktop work, lots of huge things were done there that started in Fedora. And quite honestly, as a guy that's lived through many, many Red Hat releases in the last 14 years, if we hadn't been in Fedora, we'd be in trouble for RHEL 7. So that's the Fedora ad and the thank you for all of your help in that space. Let's get to hardware. We're currently shipping Power 7 Plus. Eight cores per processor, 
We run in our virtualized environment, which we call PowerVM. We run up to 20 VMs a core is what we recommend people will do. So you do the math all the way up to the high end of the systems. That's uh, a fair number. Processor speeds will go to 4.4 gigahertz on the processors. Huge bump actually in caches in this time frame. Uh, but the most exciting thing in this processor, because this one was really just better speeds and feeds over Power 7, was they added three new hardware accelerators built into each of the cores. So each core has its own uh, set of three accelerators. The first one is a random number generator. Second one is a compression engine, a very specialized compression engine. And the third one uh, is uh, an encryption engine. The random number generator we've enabled for kernel entropy and, and a lot of the, the sort of intrinsic capabilities associated with getting good random numbers. Uh, so that's been enabled. The encryption engine is used underneath things like EcryptFS and the various libraries that, that, uh, that are used for encryption. And the compression engine is one that we're still working with the community on how to leverage. Uh, we've been working with a, on a project called Z-Swap and other pieces to try and compress memory that's unused before sending it out either in swap or in file systems. The idea is if you have memory that's not being touched, you can use this engine to compress things down. And it's faster to keep it in memory but uncompress it when you need to touch it than it is to do things like swap or uh, you know, so that the idea is you will have more cycles, processor cycles, engine cycles to uncompress this stuff on touch when you need it. So uh, that's the exciting thing. Now, uh, those three changes, the enablement for those three changes, we have yet to get into RHEL 6. They will be or are in RHEL 7. I think we have them slated for 6.6. .6, so we're hoping to, to pick up some of those uh, in, the, in the next RHEL 6 update, um, but certainly already been ex enabled in Fedora. They're there. We're using them. Fedora is our testing ground for those things. So that's Power 7. Now, one of the things that makes our chip so unique is the threading. We call it simultaneous multi-threading. Is that right? Oh, it just says multi-threading. SMT is what you will hear us call it, as opposed to, what are they, paper threads? SA6 world, is that the right, right, right phrase? The fundamental difference as I understand it, and, and the pictures give you the evolution of what has occurred with threading, which is basically in the old days, the various execution engines of the processor would work on a task at any given time slice. So this is the engines and who, what are they actually doing. When we did our first attempt at multi-threading, what we called hardware multi-threading, it was a very lumpy, coarse-grained usage of the hardware thread. So the first hardware thread would work for a few cycles, and then we'd spend a cycle getting the next hardware thread ready to go, and then we'd work our way back. And so it was very, very lumpy. When we called it simultaneous multi-threading in the Power 5 days, which was two generations of processors earlier, we started dispatching both of those at the same time. So at that time, it was two of them. If they weren't colliding for resources in the various execution engines, they would make progress simultaneously through the core. In Power 7, we added in two more, which says, you know, the idea is to try and fill up the pipeline as full as possible. In Power 8, we go to eight threads now, and I'm going to talk about that in the Power 8 slides. Uh, but the fundamental difference with the threading really is one of the core benefits of power systems versus x86 systems. We really believe our threading model, our ability to pack the various engines in very tightly and keep them utilized across the threads becomes very important. In fact, in the NUMA benchmark that we saw in the pneumoware scheduling, the spec JBD. Java is one of those environments that just thrives on having hardware threads. So that's where places like SMT8 in Power 8 is really going really to help us. Conceptually, 
the benefits of SMT, it's not like adding processors to an event. This is the best way to sort of conceptually visualize it. If I ran SMT1 and called that a unit of one, basically no hardware threading, just a single thread, and we took a workload that was balanced, uh, you could get a unit of one. When I put it in two mode, you see that first unit actually does a little less work. But the second unit does wor work. If you total them together, you accomplish on the order of what, one six, one five-ish amount of work in there, not two. So there is some, there's a really degradation. If you think about that previous, if you think about this change and visualize this, one could envision as your process is working its way through the things it needs to do. At some point it collides. We want the same load store portion of the engine. Excuse me. So I have to wait while Roddick's thread goes. So that is the reason why when you turn on, there is that little bit lesser work that you accomplish. That says when you go to four, you get more benefit. And I believe what they say in the power eight is by the time we get to eight threads, we're going to be two X. I think this, I'll have to read that carefully when we get there. But we've made by adding eight and working on some other things in power eight, just taking that the next leap in the power eight world. Engineers always like speeds and feeds. So let's talk about some of the raw capabilities of the chip. As I've said, we can put eight cores on a chip, each with its own sets of caches, and we can glue up to 32 chips, which gets us to the high end, together without any extra hardware chips uh, on the outside of that. So that's what they talk about in the glueless fabric. We've mentioned the frequency. We're, we're setting up. Uh, we have DDR3. We're always chasing the memory capabilities. We can sustain bandwidth in a power seven time frame of 100 gigabits or gigabytes per second. And one of the biggest things we added was uh, EDRAM in our L3 cache. In fact, that's the technology now that's really driving us forward as well as you look forward into power eight is what we are doing with caching where we are caching, uh, because the thing we learned from Power 7 to Power 7 Plus is caches make a huge difference. And that'll continue into the Power 8 timeframe, okay? Here's the Power 8 chip. We've told people that's coming to market this year. Um, the thing I would say in, uh, in this space First thing I'll point out is traditionally our single threaded performance. If you took an x86 and ran a single threaded operation and compared it against a roughly the equivalent generation of power systems, the single threaded performance was the place where we were typically the weakest compared to the competition. They have taken our single threaded performance and, and bumped it by 1.6 times what it previously was. So a huge jump, 60% improvement. You think then about the implications of that on filling up the matrix of tasks running through it, that pays huge dividends then to how your threaded performance is going to be. And we're trying to almost double our maximum performance at the SMT8 timeframe. Uh, other things that are going on here in this chip, so I've already told you about the eight hardware threads up from four per core. We're gonna go to 12 cores on a chip. We won't run through the rest of the deep gorpy stuff. We continue with our crypto and our compression, but we are now adding hardware-based transactional memory in power eight. So this means over time, we're gonna start leveraging the work that's been going on in the LibC community. Some of that is there, I'd have to check the status. 
I didn't mention it in the RHEL 7 when I was listing the distribution. We have RHEL 7 set up, so we don't believe we're going to need to break KABI. We have the SMT8 enabled. We have to complete and work in some areas like transactional memory, but that's outside of the ABI. Um, and so we should be set in RHEL 7 for Power 8 to take advantage of this hardware. There'll be some additional exploitation things we'll be working on as well. Uh, and one of those, I believe, as a, as a concrete example is transactional memory. So lots of other goodies. Again, you see statements about caching, bus sizes, et cetera. Uh, Power 8's an exciting, exciting product for us. We're starting to get our performance numbers on this. We see the benefit of the single-threaded performance, uh, and we're excited to bring these products to market. Now let's go into the fun stuff. Software-wise, what are we working on? What do we care about? Well, I mentioned LLVM earlier. Clearly one of the places we're going to continue to work. We're not done in LLVM. We go back to the top, I will point out, you know, intermittently we say Linux is Linux, but intermittently Power Systems has been different. Bootloaders has been one of those. How many people know what Yaboot is? How many people besides uh, Josh in the back? Yeah. We are the maintainers of the Yaboot community, kind of like Survivor Bootloader. We won, we're, you know, we're the folks. We've been moving to Grub2, so our hope is in the next major release we'll be on Grub2 for... Uh, for bootloaders, that gets us to commonality, right? Again, you want Linux to be Linux, uh, and so hopefully we can take Yaboot and put it in mothballs and be done with it. So I know we have some challenges there. Um, other things I'm going to point out, I know you folks are intimately uh, involved in OpenStack, consuming that. We've also said we're working on not only OpenStack, but also KVM, so we've been putting our patches into the Fedora environment for KVM and enabling that. I have a slide on that. Been working with the OpenJDK community. Huge for power systems. And this is another place where Fedora work has paid off for us. I discovered on one of my nice trips to visit Phil in Stuttgart that the people working on the JIT for the OpenJDK in power were just up the road in Waldorf. So I stopped in and said, there's some people you should meet. We introduced Phil to our friends at SAP that were working on the JIT, that are working with my IBM colleagues who are also working on the OpenJDK. And we're going to end up with a JIT for power systems, for power Linux, that will be able to get into Fedora and now have something other than that GCJ for using as Java. In fact, rumor is that Phil recently built the whole Eclipse uh, package with the new OpenJDK in less time than it took us to have an interlock meeting, which would be about an hour. Uh, so OpenJDK is key to what we are doing. I've mentioned the Z-Swap work. That falls under the various products associated with the transcendental memory, not to be confused with transactional memory. Don't ask me to explain both of those, but they do sound like a trip one way or the other. You know, ooh, an experience. But moving on down further, we also have work underway in V8. We have a uh, proof of concept JIT out there for V8, which then enables Node.js enables MongoDB and all the rest of the things that are now consuming V8. I'm not excited about SpiderMonkey, but it may be an unnecessary evil as well. I think JITs are starting to reproduce like rabbits and bunnies. Uh, but hopefully, uh, those things will converge and get under control. But these are the types of workloads. These are the types of things as IBM commits to power Linux this final time and really ramps up that become really important to where we want to go as well. So let's talk about a vision. I'm giving you the details at sort of the package level and the, the, the technologies we're looking at. There was an experience we had back with Watson. Does anybody remember the Watson system? Anybody know what Jeopardy is? could ask you a Jeopardy style question, right? Who beat Ken Jennings? 
Oh, I know. The answer would be uh, Watson, and the, the, the answer to it would be who beat Ken Jennings, I suppose, could be the, the question, right? That's the way Jeopardy's played. They give you the answer, and you formulate the question. We learned from Watson. We took Linux. It was SUSE Linux at that time because that was the only one that would exploit Power 7. We put it on our 750 class system, so basically a 32 core system, four socket system, 32 cores. We added Hadoop on top of that and some deep analytics, and that was the foundation for Watson. And I have to tell a funny story. I have a 16-year-old son who hangs out in various Linux communities. In fact, he's the smart one. I'm just the one that, that talks. He was at the presentation, or at the, in Austin with me, I was working, he was uh, watching the big game that, you know, when we did the final Jeopardy game and we beat Ken Jennings, and he came back that night and he said, Dad, that was so cool. Those were your systems and you beat the guy, and he was so excited. And, you know, I lived through winning at chess. Winning at Jeopardy was, you know, just another game to me. But as we thought about it, what we realized was Hadoop was going to be key to where the next generation of workloads wanted to go. The analytics coming out of working with Hadoop, key part of where our customers want to go. Hey, we're good at that too. It's not just about what we can do with that four-letter word operating system. It's about what we can do with Linux on our hardware. And that set us down a path. And then our friends came to us last year. Perhaps the most exciting thing, and certainly the most positive thing since uh, Motorola, you know, or an Apple signed up with us on the power chips, was our friends Google, Mellanox, NVIDIA, and Tyann helped us with this Open Power Foundation announced. Now, I'm sure you don't follow that as closely as I do, but here's a group of people that want to collaborate with us on cores, on hardware, bringing power systems products to market. All right, so there's going to be more hardware. What's the best thing about hardware? It's boring by itself. What does hardware need? Software, that's right. This group of people are committed to open source software from the bottom to the top. In fact, they even want us to provide open source firmware for the system. So they want a software stack that starts at the bottom with open source firmware. They want KVM, they want OpenStack, they want Linux. They want everything we do. That coupled with a vision of where the next great application's going to be in the open source space. What's gonna happen with Node.js? What's gonna happen with Nginx? What's MongoDB gonna do for people? Those things, which we believe we'll be good at, makes me excited about this vision. So it started with Watson but it ends up with what we like to call the open platform for choice. All right, and so that's the vision of where we're headed, what we're doing, why I get excited about it. Let me dive into KVM just for a minute and, and help you understand why this is important to power systems and why this is a huge change for IBM. IBM has traditionally owned our hypervisor, PowerVM, yes, we've run operating systems on top of that, and then we've built software on top of that. So we've owned everything. Linux was a big stretch for us to give up the operating system. We've owned everything up and down the stack and started there. If you start looking at running KVM, we realize you can build a enterprise for fee portion to the business, but you can also meet the needs of people that want pure open source. And here's where you can start to get to, hey, KVM's open source, if I can give them open source firmware, I've now met the requirements for an open environment. Uh, so now we would take something like KVM, or PowerVM, has anybody ever used PowerVM in here? 
Can you explain to me what an HMC is? And why would I want to have a console that controls my LPART? Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well said. He <laughs> Quite honestly, it's mainframe heritage. That's the way LPARs are managed in the mainframe world. That's really the heritage of the virtualization for power VMs. You, you try to explain that to somebody that's run VMware, and that's the question you get. Why do I need this thing over here to manage this? So the beautiful thing about KVM, simply put, is they will recognize this stack, the people that I want on the platform. And the people that I want on the platform are the people that are coming from a traditional x86 market. That's the first reason KVM's exciting. The second reason KVM's exciting is there are going to be things that this world can do, highly virtualized cloud images, lots of them, that this world is a little bit clunky. So I believe we will enable a whole set of new cloud solutions that we wouldn't be able to reach on the left-hand side. So we're going to help IBM not only by bringing new customers, but getting them into new space. So the one other comment I will make, though, is we're going to build systems that will run either environment. We're not going to lock them into you must run this way or that way if you bought the system. Of course, there'll be software licensing. You'll have to pay for which environment you're running, but you could theoretically go back and forth. One could envision maybe starting with KVM, wanting some feature that they only find in Power VM, and therefore wanting to switch their system over to the other one. Or, more appropriately, they may start here with Power VM, decide KVM's a great place to save money in their enterprise. They can run it on both their X platforms and their Power platforms. And so they'll go to KVM in the enterprise, and they'll end up over here at some point as well. So both are very feasible, okay? Mom was an English teacher. She said, always make sure you give people extra information. They can find stuff. So where can you find more information on things I've talked about, Power Linux and the environment? Well, this is the marketing portal. This is where most of our Power Linux technical and detail information hangs out in what we call our developer works community. A bunch of us hang out in the Power Linux community in Google Plus. I tend to ask questions out there, get answers, have more technical discussions out in Google Plus. And then we roll that up and intermittently send feeds of things that are occurring in the various environments out through Twitter. Uh, for those people that are more social than I am. I am not a Twitter person, and I don't do Facebook. So that's where you can get more information. If you want to get involved in Fedora, love to have the help. Now, not everybody has power systems to help with. So there's where you find out who's helping Phil with these things, and Jeff, and all of our good friends. I will give a shout out to the folks at the Open Source Labs at Oregon State University. They're the place when somebody comes up with a problem. So most often in Fedora, if we find a package that breaks, we need to get a package maintainer onto a system. We can get you an image out in Oregon State, and you can go work in that image as long as you need to, as you want to. So if you're looking for a place to do more technical development of a package, maybe fix a problem, maybe do a port if you want to make sure something runs on power systems. There's a great place to do that. Likewise, I have a colleague here down front. Merrick, you want to raise your hand? He's interested in anybody and willing to help anybody and has systems to help customers, ISVs, that want something a little bit more uh, secure at their fingertips, at their hands. So you know, if you're one of those people that are interested in that, feel free to contact uh, Merrick or come down and talk to him after the fact. And if none of those names help you or you remember anything when you get the PDF, there's my email. There's the pointer to the Developer Works community. There's Google Plus. I answer your emails before I answer Merrick's emails. 
Phil, you're somewhere in between there. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, as chief engineer, my job is to, we call it, be forward facing in the foxhole. Basically, uh, talk to folks, help people solve problems, help them understand what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and that's where we get that. So let's wrap it up and we'll take a few questions. Again, doing good things for mom, the English teacher. Let's summarize. Linux on power, fundamentally, if we go back to the question of why, is it's a great combination of our hardware heritage in the Unix space with the innovation of where people are going, such as yourself, with Linux in the future. So we start there. We've been working as a team, Red Hat and IBM, for some time. Various levels. I think we've got a great thing going now with Fedora, with RHEL 7 now enabled for Power 8. We're part of the process. We know how to work together. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful relationship. It's one now that we're growing as we move forward into new projects like LLVM, KVM, and emerging applications, MongoDB, V8, Node.js, Nginx, all of those, Redis, all key things. So if you can help us, great. If you want to participate, love to have you. If you need anything, you know how to get a hold of me, and you've been awfully quiet. You haven't asked me any questions. I would love a couple questions here. I was not that good, folks. Yes, in the back. Fire away. Excellent, excellent question. Yeah, so I'll repeat it for the people that didn't hear it because I heard you get on some speakers earlier. Power VM has a tight relationship to the hardware. What we call RAS features, reliability, availability, serviceability features. Uh, will we be implementing those in KVM and open sourcing those? Let's start with saying many of the system features that are RAS features have already been enabled. Things like enhanced air handling you'll find in the kernel. We can recover from PCI bus errors on adapters and nobody has to touch the system. So those sorts of things we have already done, we've already open sourced, they're already available in Fedora, in RHEL. As well as enabling the whole structure of the service processor and the relationship with the operating system. Because there are times when the hypervisor really isn't doing much on the system. There are some things that the hypervisor does underneath all operating systems. We're in the process of enabling that in the firmware. And yes, the goal is not to compromise the integrity of the solutions by leaving something out. Now, there's a little bit of work to do there. PowerVM only has about a 15 year head start on us. But we'll close that gap. Uh, and actually, we are, we are working very diligently on that. And when we open source the firmware, that is one of the reasons why you would want to open source the firmware so that people building derivative products in the Open Power Foundation will be able to ensure that they tie those pieces back together. So absolutely a key part to what we are doing. And that will be the type of KVM experience we want people to have. Great question, gold star. Thank you. Question down here, yes. You've heard KVM isn't that great? Or Power VM isn't that great? Okay. Okay. So he's asking about limitations in the KVM world versus the Power VM world, and will they be similar or different? Things like overcommit, 
Power VM has been doing for a long time and Linux has enabled. We call that active memory sharing in the memory space. We call it uh, micro partitions or pro in, in the processor space. We share I.O. So many of those things that you think of in the KVM world actually have been going on in the Power VM world. We just changed the name to confuse you. We have already enabled many of those features in the KVM space, including things like, uh, what's the memory uh, thing that runs around? K KSM, yeah, KSM and others, balloon driver, all of those things. We've been pulling all of those pieces together. We've implemented the pieces that allow for the extreme virtualization that occurs in KVM. And our first impressions of what we're seeing is that it's, it's a nice, nice fit. We like what we've seen so far. Proof will be in the pudding when we bring it out uh, as to how it actually performs in the end. Hey, it's a roadmap. You know, I'm playing catch up there too. KVM's got, what, five, seven years of history? So I'm only, you know, I'm 15 years behind PowerVM and seven years behind KVM, but we'll get there. Now, it's a wonderful thing about open source. When you start the ports, you start learning with it. Uh, and there are inherent things built into the power hardware for virtualization that we indeed will leverage such as isolating our I.O. When an LPAR does an I.O., we use an intermediate token that's kept in the hardware. It's called a TCE. And that same token will be used in a KVM space. And our hypervisor modes and the protections that's used by PowerVM get used in the KVM world. In fact, that's why we're not sticking KVM on top of PowerVM, is the sharing of that hypervisor state is not something that would have been pretty or that anybody would have wanted. And so we own, the, we own the hardware in the KVM world, just like in PowerVM, and we'll be able to exploit all the things we need to do to do KVM virtualization in an efficient way. So it should be a good, should be a cool thing. Great question. Another question. He says we're out of time. And let, one more, may I take one more? If you need to go, you could go, but we'll take one more question here, and then anybody else can come down. Yes, sir. Ah, great question. His question was, is, is it our intention to virtualize system I on top of KVM? How many people know what system I is? How many know what it was before system I? AS400. You forgot the AS400E and all the things in between, but that's a great question. Um, most people usually ask about that other operating system, AIX. Uh, it turns out in the power VM world, there are two types of partitions. If you look at the PAPR interface between the virtualization layer and the operating system, there's the RPA partitions. I have no idea what those stand for anymore. And there's the I partitions. Linux and AIX are the RPA partitions. The hypervisor can't tell the difference between the two. When we enabled the legacy Linux releases for Power KVM in the world we're talking about here, we're using the virtual drivers and emulating Power VM. So RHEL 6 in this environment won't know it's on KVM. It'll think it's on Power VM. Now, RHEL 7 will use VertIO and the natural pieces. The reason that's important is. AIX then theoretically could leverage the same sort of technology because it uses the same sorts of virtualization mechanisms. But IBM I, because it's a fundamentally different set of interfaces to the hypervisor, would be a lot of work. So mom being the English teacher, she says never say never and never say always. I won't say we'll never do it. What I'll say is iOS would be very expensive to put into a KVM world. Will we put AIX there? That's technically very feasible, but there's no roadmap. They still look at KVM as a Linux thing, and that's just fine with me. So, okay. Thank you very much. I'll be around. Come down if you have any more questions. I would love to answer them, help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of your conference and the lightning talk that you're going to, okay?